Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Link. We take a break from our day. Hopefully, you're taking you're not <laughs> taking a break from your faith, the faith that we uh, so desperately need in our seasons of challenge, but also in our seasons of joy. Uh, I hope you guys are all doing well today. I want to welcome you to what I believe is now up to session six. And uh, again, 15 minute segments. Just know that you're only through just a little bit more than one section if we were going to teach it an hour. But um, we are still in Genesis chapter. Well, we're moving into chapter three now. So, you know, in six sessions, we've we've made it, you know, I guess a half a chapter a day. So I suppose we'll be done by the time Jesus comes back. We'll see. Anyway. But I want to read the story uh, of Genesis chapter three with you this morning, um, and we're gonna so we're gonna be reading down through verse uh, thirteen. It said, "Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said to you, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden?" The woman said to the serpent, "From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat from it." or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that there was a tree that was desirable for to make them wise, she took from its fruit, she ate, and she gave it also to her husband, and he ate as well. And then both of their eyes were opened, they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loin covering. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord called the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this. Later down in to verse 16, and he said, To the woman he said, and then in 17, Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you not to say. And all of these are, as we go into the consequences of this reality, this thing called sin. Now, sin is what I want to talk with you about this morning. And sin is kind of one of those things that uh, in certain points in history and certainly in our present area, has fallen into disrepute. People want, oh, I don't believe in sin. Sin is just this outdated thing. It's this religious deal that, that's put in charge by powerful people to control the weak. People don't want to think of themselves as sinners, and they don't want to actually believe that sin exists. But is that necessary? Is that the case? And, and certainly you can't make a biblical argument that that's the case. And I could, you know, go for hours on end and probably not even get through the first five books of the Bible, in which proves that sin is real. Uh, but one of the challenges that we have sin is that we've equated sin with breaking the rules. Sin equals breaking the rules. And today my goal is to convince you that not only that sin is real, right, but though sin has rules, it isn't just simply legalism, right? And I want you to understand the nature of sin and what it does and how it works, okay? So if you've grown up in the church, you've probably heard the uh, the definition of sin is something like missing the mark, the Hebrew word hata, right, which means missing the mark. And so to give you a picture of that, you you figure uh, an archery person, an archer puts out a target, right? And the target, they pull back and they draw and they shoot and their goal is to hit the target. And if you miss the target, right, you miss the mark. And so our, our concept of of sin is that, you know, God puts out the target, and this is what we're supposed to do with our life, right? If we miss the target, we sin. And if we hit the target, we're righteous. And if we miss the target, we have to repent and we have to try again. And so God creates this paradigm in which we're supposed to live and we're supposed to do everything by the book. We're supposed to do it perfectly. And if we do, then we're sinless. And if we don't, then we are sinful. 
And while this definition is, is, is true in one sense, practically speaking, it becomes extremely legalistic. And the other thing is it becomes, and I'm sure you've noticed in your own conversations that you've had about Christ, it becomes really difficult to defend, right? Because how do we define the mark, right? Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, it's, is it eating from the right tree? Is, is that the definition of sin, whether we eat a right tree or wrong tree? Is it the Ten Commandments? Is it the 613 laws that are given in the book of Leviticus? You say, well, only the ones that I obey, those are the important ones, and the ones that I don't obey, those aren't really important, right? Or is it the standard that Jesus sets forth on the Sermon on the Mount? Or do we wipe all that away and say, well, yeah, Jesus said that, but he also just said, love God and love others. So as long as I just do that, the rest of what he said doesn't matter, right? Do I look at the do I look at the sins that Paul mentions in you know Romans chapter one or First Corinthians chapter six, where we have kind of these lists of the the depravity of mankind? What is sin and what isn't? And what we end up with if we try to defend sin in this way is this legalistic here's the rules kind of thing. Is that uh, we get lost in an overwhelming. Uh, sense of religiosity, right? And this is what the religious leaders of Jesus' day were doing and, and why there was so much turmoil around sin is because they were writing volumes and volumes and volumes of literature on what is sin and what isn't. What does it mean to hit the mark? What is the mark and what isn't the mark? And so I just want us to back up from that, right? Not to disregard that, but to go one step deeper and ask ourselves a question this morning, what is sin and what, is, what does it do? And so again, this is where our framework is so important. This is where we have to build out of this father-son, father-child relationship that's given to us all the way from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation chapter 22, okay? Is that God is our Heavenly Father, we are His children, and we were created for the purpose that God would be able to share His goodness with us. That is what true love does. It shares its best. It shares itself. And so how does God share his goodness with us? What's the, what's the conduit with which these gifts flow into our lives? So currently, uh, one of the things that we're, we're, our uh, economy is involved in, of course, it's not working very well right now, is, but it's the transportation of oil. And there's a, I believe there's a pipeline, right, that runs from the north all the way to the south. And that pipeline is the conduit by which the oil is transferred from its location of origin to its location of destination. What happens when you damage the pipeline? Right? You damage or you cut off or you actually restrict the flow of getting to its destination. The same thing is true if you have an outlet and you clip the wire. Right? The wire is the conduit by which the electricity flows to the outlet, right? You can't get the oil without the pipeline. You can't get the electricity without the wire. And my question is, what is the conduit by which God shares his goodness with us? You know, what is, the, what is our pipeline by which this transfer or this gift comes? And it's really quite simple. It's the father-child relationship. It is the relationship. The relationship, when the relationship between God and and man is damaged, it affects the flow of everything that God wants to share with us. And this is what I want to teach you this morning, right? Is that sin is anything that damages this relationship with our Heavenly Father, because anything that damages the relationship with our Heavenly Father also damages the purpose for which God has created us, which is to be recipients, to be sharers in his goodness. It, it obstructs the flow, right? And so this is where standards and rules come into play, right? But there's a deeper reality that's functioning underneath of it, underneath it. So if, if you've been in the church, you've probably heard me talk about this before, but um, this is, this is a, a really helpful way for me to understand the dynamics of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. I call it the, the relational ethic, right? So uh, all of you have a relational ethic. And simply what that means is, is that there is an ethic or is, there is a standard that you mandate that other people have to share in a relationship with you, okay? So for instance, um, for me, one of the ethics that or the standards that I set is if 
you mistreat my children, that is going to damage our friendship. That is going to hinder our friendship, our, our relationship. Okay, I'm not going to let you in my home. Right? If you can't keep a secret, that is going to hinder how much I can share with you, correct? Okay, if you are a very, very poor manager of money and you come to me with open hands, it's going to affect how much of what is mine I share with you, right? And so the, there are standards that are involved and the higher that other people can live, so I have these standards, right? In terms of sharing myself with you and, and the, the higher you live to those standards, the more willing and able am, I am to share myself with you. But the weaker our relationship is, the less I will actually be able to share with you, right? Now listen, this is where it's real important, okay? It doesn't mean that I love you less, right? It just changes how much I can share with you. Okay, so every single one of us have people that we love dearly, that we wish that we could share greater blessing with, that we wish we could share more of ourselves with. We love them dearly, but because of the way that they have behaved, because they haven't lived up to the, the standard that we have placed on them, we can't share ourselves with them, right? And it's, and it's not just moral standards. It's not just don't lie, don't cheat, don't abuse, right? It's even standards that are, that are just very relational, like quality time. Like, are you really concerned with the things that are going on in my life? Uh, are you compassionate towards, towards me and the things that I value? Are you understanding? And the more, the more fully someone gives themselves into your paradigm of a healthy relationship and what you need from them, the more that you are going to be willing to share with them, right? Um, in other words, we all have this relational standard. We have this relational contract, so to speak, and the ability to uphold that contract determines how much we can share with other people. The more intimate the relationship, the more that we can share. The more distant the relationship or the more broken the relationship, the less that we share. Relationships are our means of sharing ourselves with others. And here's the other thing. No one gets to determine what that standard is for you. You don't get to come to me and say, Brian, I hate your children, and if I see them, I'm gonna slap them in the face, but I'm also gonna come live in your house, and you're gonna share your food with me, and I'm gonna get one of the bedrooms. Like, because you love me, Brian. Well, you're right, I, I, I love you, I think, uh, but you don't get to tell me what my standard is, right? You. You don't get to tell me, Brian, we're going to be real good friends and we're going to share all our deepest, closest secrets, but I'm going to lie and I'm going to, I'm going to blog about everything you write about. But because you love me, you have to share all that with me anyway. Like You don't get to hold me hostage to your standard. Who I share myself with is based on my standard. And likewise, who you share yourself with is based on your standard. But here's the interesting thing. We know that that's true in our relationships with one another. But when it comes to our relationship with God, so often we say, well, God loves me, therefore he's just going to put up with it. I am actually going to determine the grounds upon which I share a relationship with God. And then I'm going to say, but you have to let me into heaven. You have to bless me financially and you have to give me a pretty wife. Is that we expect because God loves us that we are going to somehow magically receive this overflow of him sharing with us when we completely disregard everything that uh, that's valuable and important to our Heavenly Father. We share ourselves in proportion with the health of our relationship. And this is really what Genesis 3 comes down to. And it's very, very simple. It gets more complex as the Bible goes on. But it's very, very simple. Is that God sets up this, this relational ethic, right? Remember Adam and Eve. Okay? They still have, remember Adam and Eve still have a lot to learn. We're early stages of the relationship yet. But he says, if you want to share in the garden with me, I need you to trust me. I need you to believe me. And I need you to show me that by simply avoiding that tree. That's it. I need you to trust me. I need you to believe me. And I need you to show me that, to demonstrate that by simply avoiding that tree. And when they broke the standard, when they broke that ethic, right? they began, they broke this relationship. And in breaking the trust, in breaking the relationship, they have broken the flow. And that's what sin does. They sinned, right? They broke the relationship 
because the relationship is the conduit. And so just as uh, I have spent the last 13, 14 years of my life getting to know my wife so that I could love her better and create a more intimate relationship so that we could share more of ourselves with one another. That's the same thing that we're called into with our Heavenly Father, right, is spending time to get to truly know him, to know his standard, to know what's valuable to him, to live into that. Because the more I live into that, the more of the blessing and the giving and the sharing that we receive. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, uh, I just ask that uh, we would have a healthy understanding of what sin is and that we are called to live in relationship with you. And that relationship with you really is the destination because it's through that that you not only share yourself with us, but that you share your goodness, your blessing, your abundance, and your riches, that it all comes through that. And so uh, I ask that we would just be refocused again uh, to know you and to live uh, according to the way that you've called us to live. And not just moral standards, Lord, but, but quality time, concern, compassion, these character values that are so important to you that as the closer we come to you, Lord, the more, the more of you we may be able to receive through this conduit that you have created called relationship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody. Love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow.